I don't know about counting. I'm a Mississippi public school refugee, so reading and math are not my strong suits. But uh, as you can tell, I'm the best of what's available today. So I think th th there were some breaks that uh, needed. Now, I, on a serious note, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be up here talking to you guys. And we're going to touch a little bit on mature believers today. So I, I've got my glasses. So I think I'm, I'm firmly in that category. Um, I'll just want to pray again real quick, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up this teaching, Lord, and just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Just bless us all, Lord, and just help us to, to take what you, what you want us to glean from this and, and to just live our lives as an example, Lord, and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if we remember the book of Titus, uh, Paul wrote to Titus, his spiritual son on Crete, uh, where, where the, in chapter 1, Titus is told to set things in order and appoint, appoint elders, and then there's a last little piece about false teachers. And it's interesting, though, who were the Cretans? I mean, Paul in Titus 1, verses 12 to 15, basically says, one of them, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. So he didn't have a super high opinion of the Cretans, as we can see. Um, chapter 2 kind of deals with qualities of a sound church. He, 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 he sets out its specific groups that there are directions given for. Uh, one quote that I actually saw while I was getting ready for this by a pastor named Burke Parsons was, Shallow theology leads to shallow preaching and shallow worship. But the deeper we go in the doctrine of Scripture, the deeper the preaching, the deeper our faith, the deeper our love, the deeper our worship, the deeper our reverence, and the higher our praises. So if we start off, I'm going to pick it up, chapter 1, verse 16, and just kind of flow from there, because I, I thought it was kind of the, it, it's kind of an exclamation point that segues into two. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. But as for you... Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. You know, slack, slack or weak doctrine will lead to slack or weak living. I mean, if we're not, if we're not following the correct teachings, they're not going to impact our life as they should. And it's interesting, the Amplified Bible version actually says, but as for you, teach the things which are in agreement with sound doctrine, and then it, in brackets, which produces men and women of good character whose lifestyle identifies them as true Christians. You know, knowing and practicing sound doctrine, you know, should, should also translate into right living. I mean, every day, it's our sanctification. We're striving to walk closer and closer with the Lord every day. You know, the Living Bible actually says, speak up for the right living that goes along with true Christianity. And, and I think Paul, having been, having been to Crete, he understood the conditions, and he knew that to change the people there to be better and more righteous, they needed a model. They needed to model someone whose life would be an example of a righteous life. He wanted to ensure that the Cretan Christians behaved in a way which was consistent with what they said they believed. And, you know, our, our, the Lord Jesus came into the world to atone for our sins, but also to be a living example. And we were told, follow him. We're told to model. Sorry, it's my, my old age there. I lost my place. I apologize. Titus was to teach the church on Crete how to conduct themselves according to sound doctrine, but he is also charged to be an example several times by Paul. Something to consider, you know, the Bible teaches us what to believe, but it also teaches us how to behave. And the Cretan Christians were to transform their society by demonstrating the life-changing power of the gospel every day to people around them. So Paul is told to teach sound doctrine and verse 2 goes, that older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. The NIV actually says, teach the old men to. You know, the older we get and the longer we've been Christians, we should be displaying godliness and maturity. And, and we should be reflecting God's character more and more and more. These traits don't come natural to us. You know, we've got a fallen nature, and it's something we all have to strive for. I think we know that. I mean, I still stumble, you know, myself, and I've been a Christian for... 30 years, give or take. <clears throat> and so that's kind of, that, that emphasizes the point that we need to be taught sound doctrine. We need to know what to strive for. 
and we need, we need models of people. One thing, like Romans 8, 29, or 8, verse 29, excuse me. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. We're predestined to be conformed. We're too conformed to the image of Christ. And, you know, Paul wanted the older men to display characteristics which are all marks of maturity. They, you know, it's sober, sober-minded, but I've, I read a couple of uh, commentaries which, where it's also sober-sober. <laughs> you know, the Cretans were not, they weren't known to be uh, 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 sober people. So, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, they also should be sound in faith and love and patience. You know, patience was interesting, an interesting word, too, to, to kind of hit on. It's, patience is not sitting idly around and waiting. It's, it's, it, there's, it's an action word. You know, David Guzik actually said, patience is the great ancient Greek word, who. Hupomene. Did I say that right? Hupomene? <laughs> it means a steadfast and active endurance, not a passive waiting. Older men are not just to patiently wait around until they pass on to the next world. They're to actively endure the challenges of life, even the challenges of old age. We're not supposed to sit around and kind of guard our own, our own salvation, our own knowing. We're supposed to disciple others and pour into people. Uh, verse 3 and 4, again, it talks about the older women likewise, that they may be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. The NIV, again, says teach the older women too. These are, these are action words for Titus. You speak sound doctrine. Teach the older men. Teach the older women. The older women were to exemplify or live out those behaviors, but were also to influence the younger women in the church. They were to pass on what they learned over the years. You know, I know uh, yeah, my wife's parents, for example. I mean, they, they all, they're always imparting to us things. They're, they've been married, I would, I would say, almost 50 years. They're always imparting. My wife and I have been married almost 30 years now, but we still, we still need help. We still need, you know, we, we, we get into different weird situations that, are, that pop up that it's nice to have that advice. Um, they're to, I'm sorry, they're to admonish the young women. The young women, admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. The young women conducting themselves in this way, it, help, it helps guard the message. You know, the older men act in the way that, that uh, Paul lays out, the older women the younger women, this, you'll see this whole thing is about setting examples. And it's to guard against the message of the gospel being, being impugned or, or people, you know, people are always, we see that today, right? People are always looking like, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, mm, okay, okay. So it's to guard against the message being, being uh, uh, impugned or slighted. You know, loving their husbands and children. I know, I know sometimes I'm hard to love, so I'm always thankful my wife models that, that grace to me. But um, it, it's acting in a way that's an example. And, and, and it's, if, a, if a woman is married to an unbelieving husband, for example, my, my daughter, one of my daughter's husband is not a believer. So she came here to visit us. And uh, when flying home, she flew in and out of Atlanta. So she flew back to Atlanta. They live about two hours away. He had fallen asleep. So my daughter flew here with two kids, both of them under the age of two and a half, <laughs> with multiple car seats and luggage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she, so she gets back to Atlanta. She can't get her husband. He's been asleep. Finally, she gets an oh crud phone call. He's stuck in traffic on I-75. And anyway, she sat at the airport for six hours waiting on him. And I remember, I remember she was texting me. She was very angry. And, and I remember talking to her and saying, listen, this is an opportunity for you to reflect Christ to him. He's not a believer. You can either, yeah, you can blow his eardrums out. Sure, you can. Or you can reflect Christ. You can, you can show him some grace and mercy, even though you're angry, even though you, you know, you've been sitting here and the kids are crazy, etc." Um, and luckily for me, she took it. I mean, I was able to, uh, I, was, I was happy to be able to pour into her to where she kind of took that advice and said, you know what, Dad, thank you for that. I really appreciate it because um, I was going to kill him. <laughs> so.
In a commentary by White, he says the practical worth of a religion is not unfairly estimated by its effects on the lives of those who profess it. If the observed effect of the gospel were to make women worse wives, it would not commend to the heathen. And that's it. It's, it's just, this whole chapter to me, it's set out sound doctrine. And here are the examples that we need to be. Here's what we need to do so that the word can't be slighted. So verses 6 to 8, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So he's to encourage the young men to be sober-minded, but it's sensible, right? I mean, we've all been young at various points, and we we don't have a lot of sense when we're in our teens and 20s. Some of us now don't have a lot of sense. Um, So... (laughs) He's to encourage them. But if you go back to, in all things, showing yourself. Paul goes back, show yourself, show yourself. I think we can all probably point to a time when 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 people in general, if they're slighted by a a pastor, an elder, somebody they view in leadership in the church, they never forget it. Does that seem accurate? People get angry, and it's not something they put away. I can remember... I still remember this. About 30 years ago, my wife and I were going we were thinking about moving to where my in-laws live in Middle Tennessee and we went to a church there. Never been there before, looking to move to the area. Oh, it's a, you know, it's it's X church, great. We'll go there. So we sit down and we're, we're you know, we're a young couple. We're, you know, we're in our early 20s and and this this older lady comes up and she says, "That's my seat." And we were like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, we, we, we're just visiting here for the first time. That's my seat. So <laughs> we, we're kind of like, uh, okay, okay. She, she, she gave us a tongue lashing of being in her seat. And it's something neither one of us have ever forgotten. And that kind of closed our decision off to, move, to either go to that church or even move there. We were like, well, if this is the way it is here, we don't want to be here. So that's just to say, you know, you, you, you can damage somebody in this environment. You know, you, you really can. And that's like mature believers. We're, we, we've got to set the example for younger believers. We've got to always know that the world is looking. You know, another thing, Warren Wearsby in his commentary, Paul wrote about Titus the example more than he did Titus the exhorter. A pastor preaches best by his life. He must constantly be a good example in all things. Whatever the pastor wants his church to be, he must first be himself. And I think that's just, you know, it's just pushing it, pushing it, that point in more and more and more. Maintaining purity in, in, in teaching God's truth and living out Christ's example and being incorruptible and guarding our speech, it, it, it negates any criticism. I mean, there's just, there's nothing, you know, and, and especially as the world is getting stranger these days. People are always looking to to ding Christians. You know, one thing, verses 2 to 8, I I summarize those just in my mind, and and I'm right or wrong. You know, we're to take what we know, what we have, what we've learned, and we're to share it with others in the church. Mature believers to younger believers, we're we're to disciple others. Um, We're supposed to model Christian values, and Everybody needs to be a participant, you know, growing in your faith and knowledge and training others. I mean, it's just, like I said, we can't just take it and, and kind of guard it under a, a, a blanket or a cup or whatever. Uh, verses 9 and 10, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, but to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, not showing all good, excuse me, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. This is not a, 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 an approval of slavery by any stretch. It's just, you know, slavery in the Roman world, you could have become a slave for, you know, the, the Roman legions were notorious for conquering and enslaving. And, and you know, you might have sold yourself into slavery to work a debt off. You might have hundreds of ways to become a slave. This is just saying, again, show the example, you know, show the example so that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And 
a, a, a really cool definition that I found by uh, Draper was, it literally means to make precious jewels and arrange them so as to show their true beauty. And that's what, we're, that's what we should be striving for daily. Um, the NIV even states, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. So 11 to 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Salvation is available to everyone. I mean, our, our social status, where we're at, I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of an a, a, a example of it. Mature men, mature women, younger men, younger women, slaves. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God. I mean, you, you know, I would, I would guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the, in the Cretan church, you might have had a slave and his master in the same church. You might have had a slave who's an elder who's in, in the church over the master. So there's, a, there's an equality there. God's grace is what we're saved by. That's it. I mean, you look at Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2, 21, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We just, it's purely by his great grace, excuse me. Right living by those identifying as Christians is essential because Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from every law's deed. He gave himself for us. So, you know, we're grounded in God's, I'm sorry, Hebert commentary. I like my commentaries, if you guys can't tell. I have a, I have a bookshelf. I'm, a, I'm kind of a geek with that stuff. But anyway, uh, Hebert, grounded in God's nature, grace makes ethical demands of Christians consistent with his nature, with God's nature. Uh, you know, we... we, we we should be a picture of grace personified. We should be instructing younger believers. We should be following sound doctrine and making sure that, that others around us know it and live it as well. I mean, we're called to live the way Paul outlined above, but also while living with the expectation that Christ is going to come at any time. I mean, we're it's a waiting game now. I mean, that's, that's all we're, we're doing. Um, God showed his grace by sending his son to die for us. The result of God's grace should be our commitment to denying the way we used to live and living for him. And just kind of to illustrate that, 1 Peter 1.17 in the NIV, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. We should always be expecting, always be living that way. Verse 15, to wrap it up, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Speak these things, declare these things that Paul had just uh, 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 outlined. Uh, encourage, rebuke. I mean, that's, you know, chapter one, that was it. It was set up. Here's the qualifications for elders. Set up elders, rebuke the false teachers. And when it's rebuked with all authority, it's, it's the authority coming via Paul or coming from God via Paul. I mean, it's, he's giving to, t to Titus. And that's it. Rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you because you're a representative of, of God. You're a representative of Christ. You're, you're, you've got that authority there. So just to wrap it up, one more quote from a commentary. Sorry. Uh, Hebert again, the minister's authority rests in the nature of his message. He is not raised above the truth, but the truth above him.